Hello, BookTube. I have a two-book mail haul for you here. I uh, had a mail haul earlier today. I'm afraid I opened it without you. <laughs> that won't happen often, uh, but it did happen this one time. Uh, but this one is two packages. They are fairly hefty. We've got all sorts of landslides going on here. Uh, and I'm hoping for something noteworthy. <laughs> so I have one thing in mind that I'm hoping one of these things is. But you never know. I'm, I'm beggars won't be choosers. So we'll, let's, we'll do the two of them. We'll get out of this in less than five minutes. Quick and easy. Nobody gets hurt. <laughs> so what is this first one? Uh, it's in one of these big vacuum pressed white envelopes that the bean does not want. Uh, this is from August. Okay. Uh, but, but, but what is this? It's a novel. A literary novel, I'm told. <laughs> this is Gods with a Little G by Tupelo Hosman, the author of Girl Child. Some of you will know Girl Child. That is the cover. A lost cat ad. Gods with a cat with a little G. Uh, in 2012, Farrar, Strauss, and Jero published Tupelo Hosman's Girl Child to wide, wild acclaim with raves from Amy Bender, Bonnie Jo Campbell, People Magazine, The New York Times, and Sam Sachs at the Wall Street Journal? What does he know? <laughs> uh, and on, uh, in, on August 13th comes the new book, uh, Gods with a Little G. And I'm gathering from the pub sheet here that I'm not supposed to capitalize the title of either one of those books. So we have another pretentious pants on our hands. Uh, a vibrant literary novel, Gods with a Little G, again with the typos of the, the title of the book not being capitalized, uh, is the story of Helen Dead Letter. I'm glad her name is capitalized anyway. A teen trapped in politically bright red and extremely religious town of Rosary, California, with a widow father who is a true believer who lives in Rosary, California. Uh, Helen's mom lost her battle with cancer when Helen was a child, and her dad is mired in his grief, lost the consolation prize of, pay, of prayer, or so he seems until he finds love with the mother of the leader of Rosary's rebels, uh, who also happened to be Helen's secret crush. Helen tries to escape her father's burgeoning romance and her own confusing feelings for the king of the Rosary's rebels by focusing on her work, apprenticing her aunt the country's lone psychic and spiritual rebel. Okay, all right. Okay, let's, let's go over that again, okay? I realize we want to cut this down for time, but let's go over that absolute mess again, okay? <laughs> okay, there is a teen girl. <laughs> Her name is Helen. She is trapped in a politically bright red and extremely religious town, Rosary, California, with a widower father who is a true believer. Helen's mom lost her battle with cancer when Helen was a child and her dad is mired in his grief, lost to the consolation prize of prayer, or so he seems until he finds love with the mother of the leader of Rosary's rebels, who also happens to be Helen's secret crush. Is the father consoled by prayer or not? I have no idea from that absolute train wreck of a sentence. All I know is that already I can tell from the, from the plot description that Christianity is going to be held up here as a de facto bogeyman. You're supposed to hate it out of the gate. The author is not going to need to waste any time with that. That, of course, a place called Rosary, California will be a persecution zone for teenagers. And, of course, the young teenage girl in the novel will be a lesbian. And, uh, <laughs> and of course, the father would admire it in, Greece, uh, in grief until the minute that his lust kicks in. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> let's forge on. Uh, when Helen begins her first real relationship with Win and Rainbow Lean, siblings just arrived in Rosemary with a desire to depart Rosemary. Rain in part because she'll finally be able to get the hormones she needs to, fu to fully become herself. Okay, so the characters are called Rain and Win, Win and Rainbow Lean. Boleen is not the last name. The, the name is Rain Boleen. R-A-I-N-B-O-L-E-N-E. -E. And Rain wants to leave the town of Rosary, California, which is a Bible Belt, extremely deep red religious town, 
because she is trans, because she needs the, the money and the, the opportunity to get the hormones she needs in order to change her gender. She starts to see a future for herself for the first time outside of the tea leaves she tries and fails to read under her aunt's tutelage, though it may be too late. Set in a near version of the current political apocalypse. Uh, Gods with a little g, again, uh, the typos of it not being capitalized, is about how being a teenager is an apocalypse all its own. There must be destruction for there to be hope. Well, I would think it would be about that it would be about how being a teenager is an apocalypse all its own, since the teenager in question here is a a gay atheist Wiccan whose best friend is a is a struggling transvestite and whose father is a grief stricken ultra-religious man who's shacking up with another woman in town. <laughs> so, so I would think that it would that would be an apocalypse. <laughs> God help us. And you people wonder. <laughs> you wonder why I prefer nonfiction to this kind of garbage. Where, where the author just says, well, let's see. How many hot-button grievance issues can I push in one novel? And, uh, you know, God forbid you criticize any of it as being ineffective. Because that way, we know what that makes you. <laughs> I just, well, let's see. I'm going to come up with a character, and then I'm going to come up with 8,000 totally unrealistic obstacles. I, I'm, because if I slow down at all, if, I have, if I'm spinning more, fewer than, let's say, 20 plates at a time, all of them topical, all of the hot button issues, all of them, you know, red knit cap out on a march with placards on my, on my back, if I slow down at all, then it'll be incumbent on me to write. <laughs> I can't do that. I'm not supposed to explore these characters or this town. They obviously already come prepackaged. All I'm supposed to do is move them around on the board, and God forbid you criticize me for doing that. <sighs> okay. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, this comes out in in August. I have I have that long to calm down <laughs> and start taking deep breaths again because this book could easily please me. So I will I will I will not I will not hurry to read it, uh, but it could easily please me. I will I will pry open my mind till I go at it nice and even peeled, and maybe the author will surprise me. Uh, so let's <laughs> let's move on to the next book. <laughs> it sounds like, it feels like a finished copy. Oh, there you go. Oh. <laughs> Okay, all right, this is a work of nonfiction. It's a finished copy from the Harvard University Press. Uh, probably comes out in April, yes, in mid-April. It's by Stephen Asma and Rami Gabriel, and it is The Emotional Mind, The Effective Roots of Culture and Cognition. Uh, so what, what have we got here? Many accounts of the evolution of the human mind concentrate on the brain's computational power, and undervalue the role of emotions. Yet, as the authors uh, argue in this book, the long and deep evolutionary history of emotions vastly predates rational cognition. <laughs> Drawing on recent research in psychology, philosophy, and neuroscience, the authors offer a new paradigm for understanding how the human mind has evolved, with emotions at the center. If you want to understand the, the evolution of the human, and by extension the primate mind, the authors argue, then you need to understand emotions. They lay out a broad overview of how new research and effective science will force so scholars in a broad range of disciplines to rethink answers to some of the basic questions about humanity. Okay, all right. Uh, emotional science can demonstrate the surprising relevance of feelings to perception, thinking, decision-making, and social behavior. Okay. Can it? <laughs> okay. The mind is saturated with feelings. In the 21st century, it is. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, almost every perception and thought is emotionally weighted with some attraction or repulsion quality. That absolutely is not true, especially when you're talking about decisions that you have to make for purely practical reasons. That absolutely is not true. If, if you know, if for instance you are a proto-human 175,000 years ago on the African plain and you know there is a gorge half a mile to the north, and you know that coming up from the south is a large 
a herd of elephants, and you have decided amongst yourselves that you want to bottle them into that gorge in order to take a few of them, you and your dogs, what part of that is emotional? And there would be no humans without innumerable decisions just like that. What part of that is emotional? There isn't one. It, it's not like you're going to pick the, off the ones that aren't cute. <laughs> and even if you, if you bring it down to the present day, take a, a 30 foot long sailing vessel. You have a crew of six people. You are responsible for that vessel. You're in the, the, the Northern Atlantic. Let's say you have the, the absolute foolishness to be in the Northern Atlantic in, in uh, winter. Well, for the course of solid months at a time, no decision that you make will be driven by emotion. Not one. And you'd die if you didn't make them correctly. So so in the present day and leading all the way up to the present day, I don't see how that's... Oh, well, I guess maybe the authors will teach me. The mind is saturated with feelings strikes me as a very 21st century thing to say, though. Uh, and I'm wondering now if the authors are young. We'll take a look when we're done. Uh, uh, moreover... Those feelings, sculpted in the encounter between neuroplasticity and ecological setting, provide the true semantic contours of the mind. I don't think they do. The aren't the semantic contours of the mind shaped in childhood when you learn language and cognition? And aren't, isn't that learning largely free of emotions? Is there a word that you learned, a basic English word that you learned as a child that you don't use now for emotional reasons? I, uh, I don't, okay, all right. Uh, meaning is primarily a product of embodiment, our relation to the immediate environment and the emotional cues of social interaction. The challenge then is to unpack this embodiment. How do emotions like care, rage, lust, and even playfulness create a successful social world for mammals, an information-rich niche for human learning and a source for higher level cultural realities like religion and art. Okay, all right, well, I am fascinated. Uh, and this is right around the corner, so I can read this right away. Uh, Stephen Asma is a professor of philosophy at Columbia University, Chicago, and the founding fellow of its research group in mind, science, and culture. And Rami Gabriel is the author of Why I Buy, and is an associate professor of psychology at Columbia, Uni Columbia College, Chicago and was the founding fo fellow of the culture's research group in mind, science, culture. Okay, so they have similar resumes, uh, and they, okay, they are both extremely young. I don't, I'm not going to hold that against them. They're obviously brilliant, so we shall see. In fact, I will see right away. I'm going to, I'm going to read this tonight, uh, because this is just fascinating. It's, it's, uh, I'm going to argue with it, I think, a lot of the time. We'll just see. I, for instance, have never really caught into the idea of the history of the, of the mind's evolution. I don't see how we can know that. Uh, but I shall, <laughs> we shall see. I certainly, how can you know anything about the evolution of the mind for, for instance, the first 100,000 years of human existence on Earth as a separate species of hominid? How can you possibly know anything about that? There are no written records and the minds don't, minds don't survive. Uh, how can you know anything at all about the cognition of, uh, for instance, humans at a time in the African savanna when there were four other species of humans? all sharing the same biome. How can you possibly know anything about the, their cognitive world? I don't think you can. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> I promised a short mail all, didn't I? I picked a fight with both books. So we have nonfiction and fiction. We have the emotional mind. Sounds like a, one of these big, meaty, academic books that Harvard is so good at doing. The Harvard University Press is so great at bringing these things out. Every one of them is a week's worth of thought, even if you end up disagreeing with everything. Uh, I just love it. And again, I point out I, that we need academic presses for that. General interest presses would not do this anywhere near the same frequency. Uh, and then we have a novel coming out in August, which I know I ragged on it because it irritates me, because it seems like the author's just running down a grievance checklist, and I hate that. Absolutely hate it. Not only because it's incredibly lazy, but because it's also a bright orange traffic cone around the book. Sa often, it might not be in this case, saying to critics you'd better not criticize this. You know, hashtag me too, hashtag my experiences, hashtag own voices, hashtag, hashtags in yellow traffic cones all the way around this book. So mind your P's and Q's, or I'll have my followers mob you on social media and that'll be the end of you. Uh, so but, but that book is Gods with a Little G by Tupelo Hasman, who did uh, Girl Child. 
and I will give it a fair shake. I honestly will. I'm not going to read it uh, until later in the summer, whereas The Emotional Mind I'm going to read tonight. But even so, I will give it a fair shake, and we will report back. So there you go. A two-book mail haul proving once and for all that I cannot do short mail haul. So I guess we're just going to let that ship sail. <laughs> but plenty more to talk about, so I will be back. <laughs> Thank you, book two.